everyone and welcome to a short lecture about antebellum literature in America. This video is going to provide you a brief overview of the period between 1820 and 1865 in American literature, often called the American Renaissance. So make sure that you have a paper and pencil ready to take notes and feel free to pause the video whenever you need to um, in order to catch up or get clarification. So let's get started. So in this video, we're going to talk about where this phrase, the American Renaissance, comes from. And we're going to examine the historical development of this time period as the first real blooming of a truly distinct and separate national literature. We'll talk about the cultural and historical context of the time period, and we'll discuss the artistic movement known as Romanticism, which is really essential to understanding many of the works you're going to be encountering for our next few reading assignments. So as we get started, let's think about the term Renaissance. The term Renaissance likely makes you think of the European Renaissance, that period of time in a time period around the 1500s, where art and literature suddenly seemed to flourish across Europe. This period marked the end of the Dark Ages and the beginning of a new type of artistic production that emphasized realistic portrayals of the human form. It marked major advancements in art, music, and literature. So when F.O. Matheson writes his book, The American Renaissance, Art and Expression in the Age of Emerson and Whitman, back in 1941, he's really comparing a new flourishing of American writers to that earlier period, centuries before, that were seen as the epitome of art. And making the comparison, he's making the argument for something great happening in America. This work of literary scholarship, not published until the middle of the 20th century, canonized Emerson, Hawthorne, Melville, Thoreau, and Whitman as the major figures of the 19th century in American literature. But it's really important to remember the Matheson's scholarship, his argument in this book, was by no means a given or even a natural extension of the thinking of that time or of his time. In fact, only one year before Matheson published his book, another scholar of American literature, Fred Lewis Patti, wrote a book of his own about the period that he called the Feminine Fifties, in which he completely dismissed the antebellum period as producing an inconsequential array of literature that he disparagingly called feminine, regardless of whether it was written by men or women. So in addition to its rather sexist bias, Patti's book participated in a long-standing bias against 19th century American literature as less significant, less valuable, and less aesthetically successful than its British counterparts. And actually in American colleges and universities, it's really not until the mid 20th century that anybody's paying attention to American literature at all. If you're taking a literature course in the 19th century or the very early 20th century in an American um, college or university, you're likely taking the classics, so things like the Iliad and the Odyssey, or you're taking British literature. Scholarly texts such as those by Matheson and Patti established a number of critical commonplaces about American literature that defined literary study for decades. So starting in the mid 20th century, there was this idea that one, American literature is first and foremost a national tradition defined principally by its relationship to US political and cultural nationalism. And two, the focus of American literary history is a handful of great authors who were more often than not middle-class white men and they were neither the most popular nor the pro most prolific writers of this period. And you can see on this slide, there's um, an example of what American literature was considered in the mid 20th century. But this view has really changed. Um, the major revisions to Matheson's version of the American Renaissance came in the form of multicultural and feminist critiques in the 1970s and 1980s and in the transatlantic and hemispheric critiques of the 1990s. So in the 1990s, there's this idea that American literature should be all of the Americas, not just United States literature. This also continued into the beginning of the 21st century. So these various efforts to revise and expand the five-man canon of Matheson's American Renaissance have given us a richer and more complete vision of the literary production in the United States during the antebellum period. You can review the table of contents in our textbook to get an idea of how the canon has really changed beyond Matheson's initial five authors. Scholars now include authors like Harriet Jacobs, Rebecca, Rebecca Harding Davis, Emily Dickinson, Frederick Douglass, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper as important figures that influenced not only their own times, but also later writers. <laughs> 
As we move through the 19th century and the course, it's really important to remember that the notion of any literary canon is always historical and cultural. Our understanding of any author's work or their importance often changes throughout time. And sometimes we get revisions of original understandings that might have been limited by sexism or racism of scholars in their own time or even later scholars. So as we begin working through the 19th century, it's important to note that the way his, the historical moment of that time influenced the literature being produced. One of the most important historical events of that time period was the War of 1812. As we learned in an earlier video, this war was very much a second war for independence for the country. It settled once and for all that the colonies would not be part of the British Empire or under British rule. But that war had some lasting impacts on the 19th century as well. First, it left Americans feeling a real sense of vulnerability. The country was still young and having the British forces push as far inland as Washington, D.C. and burn the White House to the ground left the young nation reeling. But there were also victories in that war that created a sense of immense national pride. One of the most important victories that became something of a legend was Andrew Jackson's victory in New Orleans. In that battle, Jackson did what no one expected and pushed the British forces from the city, keeping the most important southern port safe and open. Now, Jackson himself became a kind of folk hero inspired by what is off, and he often inspired what's called the Republican hero. This figure, like Jackson himself, was an anti-aristocratic person from an obscure background who embodied the strengths and virtues of the ordinary people in the nation. One thing that's important to note, however, is that there's quite a bit of mythology happening here. Jackson might have not have been a European aristocrat, but he was really anything but common or poor. Um, before the battle, he served as a lawyer, congressman, and senator. His plantation, called the Hermitage, was over a thousand acre site where he enslaved more than 100 people. At the time of his death, he owned 150 people. He was one of the wealthiest and most influential men in the country, even before he became the hero of New Orleans. But he wasn't a duke or a king. His leadership in the War of 1812 inspired a new type of heroic figure in the popular imagination of that time that could be an everyman. And this sort of everyman hero is featured in many books um, and writings of the time. We see him in James Fenimore Cooper's Leather Stocking Tales and Catherine Maria Sedgwick's Hope Leslie. We see this figure again in the 1850s in Whitman's Poetic Persona in The Song of Myself and other poems. We see Thoreau's persona in Walden and in Herman Melville's Bartleby, and finally in Moby Dick. So it's really influential, this kind of everyman um, hero who doesn't have to be an aristocrat. One of the most immediate manifestations of cultural transformation following the War of 1812 involved a transatlantic exchange between British and American journalists over the value of American literature. Now that we were no longer fighting a war, we could talk about the relationship between British literature and its American counterpart. Um, but, that relation, but that conversation didn't always go well. The most famous soundbite from the conversation is often re referred to as the paper war is Sidney Smith's sarcastic demand from an 1820 issue of the Edinburgh Review. He says, in the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book? Prior to Smith's attack, American writers and critics had already issued a call to create a body of American literature that was independent of British and European influence. In a night 1815 issue, for instance, the critic Walter Channing urged his countrymen to, pro to produce, quote, a literature of our own. In 1818, a book called An Essay on American Poetry by the critic Solomon Brown asserted that Americans could not really claim to have won the War of 1812 until that victory manifested itself in the production of a distinctly American literature. He said, quote, the proudest freedom to which a nation can aspire, not accepting even political independence, is found in complete emancipation from literary tradition. As the introduction to our textbook points out, however, cultural nationalism is not the same thing as cultural ignorance. American writers might have taken pride in the literature they regarded, not necessarily as distinct from, but in conversation with English literary traditions. But given the language the country shared, most American literary nationalism simply hoped that American writers could take their place alongside their British siblings. There wasn't really this idea that we could surpass them yet. <clears throat> 
Similarly, cultural nationalism did not mean uncritical patriotism. One of the most notable features of the acclaimed 1820s writings of people like Irving, Bryant, and Cooper, along with writings of their contemporaries such as Sedgwick, Sigourney, and Lydia Marie Child, was just how critical these writings could be of the early national culture. So in the wake of the War of 1812, there was a shared belief among the major writers of the time that the United States did have distinct material with which to develop a distinctive, though maybe not separate, national literature. Authors such as Irving, Cooper, and Bryant placed a special emphasis on the importance of the natural landscape for the development of our national character. These writers shared a vision with the popular Hudson Valley river landscape painters of the antebellum period. New Yorkers like Thomas Cole and Asher Durand, who regularly portrayed individuals dwarfed by mountains and forests in a vast and unsettled nature where God's spirit could be apprehended. We see this in the slide that's on the screen now. Thomas Cole's The Oxbow View from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, after a thunderstorm is an excellent example of these Hudson River Valley painters and how they displayed the kind of grandeur of the American landscape and the wonder of it. Both American writers and artists at the time believed that depictions of the American landscape held the key to creating literary traditions that did not reply, rely upon British or European models. The American landscape artists not only shared a similar philosophy with their literary counterparts, but they often worked with them to create distinctly American cultural expressions, um, such as Thomas Cole's scene from The Last of the Mohicans. The one that you see on the page now is Albert Bierstadt's Among the Sierra Nevada, California, done in 1869. And again, you can kind of see just how the grandeur of the country itself dwarfs everything in the painting. Um, there's an almost ethereal beauty about it. And much of the writing of the time is going to kind of react to and be in conversation with these artistic productions. Now, when we turn to the literature of the period, we really have to pay attention to the impact of the literary market. The literary renaissance of the 1920s through the 1950s were as dependent upon the technological and social developments as they were upon cultural nationalism that followed the American Revolution and the War of 1812. It's important to note that in the 19th century, it was extremely difficult for American writers to edge out their British counterparts in the literary marketplace or to make real livings as writers. We see here Hawthorne working in the Custom House. Most of these writers had other jobs. It was difficult to make a living, not because British books were better though. At that time, the lack of international copyright law made it more profitable for U.S. publishers to simply reprint a successful British book rather than to take a risk on an untried American book. Without copyright, they could reprint the British book and not pay a single cent of royalties to that author, but if they published an American book, they would have to pay the author royalties. This meant that British texts were able to circulate through the increasingly sophisticated distribution network made possible by improved technologies in river and rail transportation. Um, we had this strangely increasing national reading public, but at the same time, because of the international copyright law, what you get is a popularity of British texts over American ones. So the growth, growth of U.S. cities and the ongoing expansion of the nation's territorial reach contributed to one of the most significant developments of the time for the writers who aspired to be professional authors, the dramatic growth of newspaper and magazine publishing. Between 1800 and 1825, approximately 400 newspapers were founded. 400. And that number went into the thousands by the 1860s. Before 1825, there were approximately 100 magazines published in the United States. And when we talk about magazines, we're talking about these kind of monthlies that have articles and stories and poems and pictures in them. Um, by 1850, there were about 600. So that's a huge influx in only 25 years. Today in the 21st century, it's really increasingly rare to even get a magazine or newspaper subscription when so much information is available electronically. It's even more rare for a person to find most of their entertainment in print. Um, we just have so many things available to us. But during this period of time in antebellum America, there are no radios, there are no televisions, there's certainly not the internet. These newspapers and periodicals were what offered people a type of leisure. They were an activity that um, people could do with their families, and it was the kind of leisure time that they would have in the evenings. They'd sit and they'd read the newspaper, they'd sit and read stories in these magazines. 
It also provided writers from the period an opportunity for publication that the book market didn't allow for. Periodical publication offered writers both financial support and the opportunity to reach a broad national audience. Periodicals, however, placed limitations on writers. They meant that stories and poems had to be a certain length and they had to fit the expectations of whatever that magazine or newspaper's target audience was. So because of the important periodicals in the 19th century American culture, what we're going to see is a really increased importance on the short story, for example, rather than a novel. And it's really one of the things that makes the short story um, kind of an American form. In addition to the periodical culture, there are some social movements at the time that influenced the literature produced. These include the women's rights movements, temperance movements, anti-slavery movements, and Native American rights. Reform movements were an integral part of antebellum culture as Americans of various political stripes sought to make the new nation the best place they believed it could be. Many American writers were either sympathetic to or wholly supportive of these reform movements, and the reform themes and images influenced, some cases defining, the literature that they produced. For example, just as debates over slavery would define politics in the antebellum period, ultimately becoming one of the principal causes of the Civil War, so too did slavery and the question of slavery influence the literature of the period. From Emerson and Thoreau's essays about the radical abolitionist John Brown to slave narrative novels by African Americans such as Frederick Douglass, William Wells Brown, and Harriet Jacob, to images of slavery and the poetry of Walt Whitman, it's difficult to overstate how profoundly the issue of race and slavery affected the writers of this period. At this time, Native Americans had already been appearing um, in American literature for many years, but the debate over the Indian Removal Act of 1830 made the question of Native American sovereignty in the U.S. a more pressing matter than before. Anglo writers like Emerson, Lydia Marie Child, and others directly attacked the U.S. policies to forcibly remove Native peoples from the nation's boundaries and relocate them west of the Mississippi. Native American writers and orators, such as Elias Boudinot, William Apes, and Black Hawk, also eloquently defended their people's right to sovereignty. Major Native American themes and images show up throughout the literature of this period. Um, for example, in the image you see here, which is from Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, there's also Sedgwick's Hope Leslie, the poetry of Whitman, and even in Melville's Moby Dick. So one final influence that we need to cover to understand the literature of this time is the aesthetic movement known as Romanticism. Romanticism originated in Europe in the late 18th century, and by the 19th century, it had really become a predominant form of artistic production. It was, in large part, a reaction to the rationality of the Enlightenment. Now, while Enlightenment writers focused on reason, Romantics focused primarily on the importance of emotion to understand and live in the world around them. There was an intense focus on the individual in Romanticism, especially the individual's emotional reaction to the national world, natural world. Romantic artists and writers looked to the past, especially the medieval period, where courtly love and knights on quests were some of the most popular and important tropes of the literature of that time. And they bring those tropes into the romantic um, writings of the 19th century. So while the world was becoming more rational, secular, and mechanical, romantics focused on nature and the natural world, reacting against the way the Industrial Revolution was transforming workers into no more than cogs in an enormous, unfeeling machine. An offshoot of Romanticism popular in the United States was dark Romanticism. Writers who will read soon, like Hawthorne and Poe, um, were dark romantics. Their works are filled with a fascination of the irrational, the demonic, and even the grotesque. While romantics believed in the innate human goodness in human nature, dark romantics believed all men inevitably drifted towards sin. Even the best and most righteous of men was at risk to give their, into their darker impulses to self-destruction. So as we begin our st study of antebellum American literature, the period in the early 19th century, let's review a couple of the major ideas. During this time, we see the beginnings of a distinct national literature, both in terms of topics discussed and in style, but there is still something of a conversation with Britain rather than a radical break from Britain. The writers that we now see as canonical weren't always so. Often writers we identify as very important to the period were not the most popular or prolific, but we have to remember that our understanding of their importance always comes out of later scholarship, especially mid-20th century scholarship. 
This, med this mid-century scholarship, which was mostly done by men, is often focused on men and the writings of white middle-class males. But in the last few decades, things have really changed. And as we can see in the table of contents of our textbook, more women and writers of color are now recognized for the important contributions they made to the national literature and to the literature that came after. As you read through the selections assigned for this unit, look for the Republican hero as a common character. This every man will serve to represent the best and sometimes the worst qualities of the still young nation. Look too for how these writers seem to address ideas both about the enlightenment and romanticism. Where do you see these writers examining the world in rational and scientific ways? Where do you see the emphasis on feelings and emotion crop up? Where do you see emphasis on nature and art? I hope that you'll enjoy some of the readings I've selected for you in this unit. As always, if you have any questions or want to talk anything through, just let me know. I'm always available during student hours by email or by appointment. Enjoy your readings of the antebellum literature and let me know how I can help.